Hello, this is Ferry Dune Sir Shansi, and I'm pleased to announce the publication of a new book called Behind and Beyond the Meter. And it's very fortunate that we have author of one of the chapters, Tim, who's here with me. And this book, as um, you, you will find out, is about what's happening with innovation and digitalization of assets and devices behind the meter. And we have roughly 20 chapters with uh, contributions from a number of people from around the world about what's happening behind the meter, so to speak. And there's a section of the book in particular that focuses on policy and regulation and tariffs, which is very important to how and why we use some of these assets behind the meter. And I would like to ask Tim to give us a brief intro into what he wrote in the chapter that he contributed to the book and why he feels that uh, prices and tariffs are particularly important when it comes to how we utilize these assets behind the meter. Thank you, Feridun. Um, thank you also for inviting me to write a chapter on the book. Um, so my chapter is about distribution, electricity distribution network tariffs. So those are the type of tariffs you pay to actually use the network, because even though these assets are behind the meter, they still use the upstream network. So somebody has to pay for that. Right. And historically, this was quite easy to do so. You just pay according to the volume of electricity you use. This was assumed to be quite fair, because if you use more volume, you're probably a bigger consumer, so you contribute a bit more to this public network. Um, and it was assumed to be a kind of a efficient. I mean, it was just the only way for these tariffs, the only principle to design them was to be fair and to recover all the costs. So volumetric tariffs worked well. Then PV came and suddenly with PV, uh, suddenly some consumers, they consume a lot of less of volume if you account for a whole year. But they do not necessarily consume the volume when they produce uh, their 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 PV power. So therefore, even though they pay a lot less for the network, they uh, still use the network as much as before. So actually the network costs remain more or less the same, but the contribution of some consumers became less. So therefore others had to pay more. So that kind of triggered this whole debate on how do we redesign the network tariffs. But PV panels is just one of these uh, evolutions behind the meters. There's also heat pumps, their electrical vehicles, their batteries. So therefore, in, the, in this chapter, I describe a sort of guiding principles of which we should respect when we think about redesigning these network tariffs, which are you should try to recover all efficiently incurred network costs. You should try to send the cost reflective signal to the consumers, like please use the grid in a way that we don't, do not necessarily have to reinforce it and, and have a lot of costs and do it in an as fair as possible way. Because if you suddenly change the network tariffs and some consumers have to pay a lot more, is probably not very acceptable. And I find that it's very hard to combine these three objectives. As I recall in your chapter, you had a big discussion about uh, equity, fairness, you know, sim simplicity of tariffs. You know, these are all things consumers have a great deal of trouble even dealing with simple volumetric tariffs. And now we're talking about tariffs that could potentially be more difficult to understand. How, how, how can we communicate with consumers the, the change that is happening with how they use the network, how they're, cost, uh, how they're costing the network, even though they're not potentially using a lot of kilowatt hours? How do you explain that to an average consumer, for example? That's uh, indeed, it's a very challenging task to do. But if we don't, if we don't redesign these networks in a, network tariffs in a more elaborate manner, then you will create trouble in terms of uh, redistributional effects. You will create a more expensive solution than you want. So it's, it's a, you have to convey that message. On the other hand, even though if your tariffs become more, more elaborate, at the same time, we see, as also described in your book, digitalization becoming more important. We see different intermediaries coming in, uh, let's say innovative retailers, innovative aggregators. So I assume that in the future, let's say in the next 10 years, 
there will be a whole uh, a room for automation. And when you have automation, then it does not matter how complicated it is. If, if your, your automized algorithm is dealing with this network tariff and you are not, assuming that you can kind of control your, your house appliances in a, in a simple manner through some interface on your phone. But then the difficult part is between the algorithm and the meter, not between you and the tariff. So let me ask you, the, one of the questions that I'm often uh, asked is exactly what you just pointed out. What are the limits to what an average consumer can do with these more complicated tariffs versus aggregators who could potentially essentially do the, do the work and so the average consumer does not have to deal with or have to you know, do anything special. They just, they just assign the task to someone else who, who does the aggregation and automation and optimization. How, how, do, how do you think that's going to happen? I, I think there are three groups of people. You talk about prosumers or, or consumers who would do it on their own. You talk about consumers who would use some kind of aggregator. But there's also a lot of consumers who don't really care. So I think when you redesign the network tariff, you need to be able that it's in a way designed that people who are so-called passive, maybe because they don't have the means to invest in, in these new fancy type of technologies or, or uh, PVs or, or batteries, that, that these consumers are somehow also comfortable with the tariff. And, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, then you can create some more difficult options where these more advanced players can make use of their, of their uh, flexibility to help the network or at least to be signaled that please don't do this in order to create all these costs. So it needs to be a default simple. If you want to do more, you're allowed to do so. If you want to do it on an individual basis, possible. If you want to do it in an aggregated basis, also possible. And therefore, it's another reason that I did not mention yet why network tariffs are important to be redesigned, is that if you want active consumers through aggregation participating in several electricity markets, maybe helping out the DSO, helping out the TSO, I don't know, maybe even playing on the wholesale market, then these network tariffs, if they're not well designed, they can really be a barrier for all these business models. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So therefore, also this you have to take into account. And what happens, you know, there's a lot of talk about community energy, the fact that individuals can form virtual or physical communities where they can trade within each other, within the community. How does that enhance the opportunities for consumers, prosumers and prosumagers as, as you see it moving forward? So I think these type of community initiatives, they can really uh, increase awareness about this whole, um, let's say, a climate challenge that we're facing, of which renewable energy at decentralized level is, is one important answer. So in that sense, it kind of uh, mobilizes awareness and it maybe also mobilizes more private capital than you would have if you would have all consumers acting individually. Maybe they would not be informed enough. There is, there is a problem, is that, okay, uh, these community uh, aggregated people, um, do they still have to pay for the network in the same way as individuals do? Uh, there are a lot of discussions ar around that. Um, network tariffs exemptions could right. be a sort of implicit subsidies, which could be on some grounds maybe justified, in other cases maybe not. I'm not sure of that because in the end, whether you're individuals or whether you're aggregated, the physical impl implications on the network, I don't know if there's necessarily very different. And in the end, the network tariff is a means to recover this physical network. So therefore, it has to reflect the impact you have on this, on this network. So whether you're in group or not, I don't know, but I do recognize that it does, has this kind of uh, social movement benefit, uh, which, which has to be recognized. Let me ask you one final question, and that is one of the case studies that is described in the book, I think there's an experiment in Switzerland where a local community basically produced, consumed and stored and shared energy within a local node. And the claim is that because they're not using the upstream assets in the network, they shouldn't pay for that 
portion of the network fees. How, how do you think this debate about who pays for what percentage of the assets of the industry, how is that going to play out in this future? It's a very complicated thing because, first of all, I, know, I, I assume that not even all network operators at real local level know what is going on. So then to map that you, or to say that you really reduce your usage of this network is a very hard claim. I think, imagine um, Hawaii, California, Australia, your major load is air conditioning. There's a lot of air conditioning when there's a lot of sun. So maybe your major load and your major generation technology, they coincide quite well. So in that sense, you could say, okay, if we collectively consume and we collectively uh, produce at the same moment, possibly, we reduce our peak need from, from this upstream network. Right. If you're in Germany or you're in Belgium or, or Switzerland, your peak load might be some cold winter evening. Right. If you invest as a community a lot in PV, that's not going to change your need for this upstream network physically. So it varies by location it varies and by context. And if you're really talking about the engineering physical implication, then it varies a lot on your, the correlation between your local consumption and your local production technology, which in some cases, then you could argue for that case. In other cases, it's more hard. But of course, then we're not talking about uh, more uh, social externalities of doing these type of communities. But purely physically, engineering, that would be my, my answer. Well, thank you again for contributing to the book. The book is available on Amazon and from the publisher. If anyone is interested in these topics, I think that might be something you might want to look into. Thank you very much. Thank you.